Agrarian Studies and Action Aid India. My name is Masako Mazong. I'm the CEO of the Southern Africa Trust and also a board member for the Samoya Institute of Agrarian Studies that is based in Zimbabwe. I think you all agree with me that uh, the series, which is a, a lively and a live demonstration of what South-South networks look like and what South-South collaboration might look like around common issues that preoccupy our times in these um, odd COVID times, you would agree with me that a seminar series that really focuses on agrarian questions of the global South is a pertinent one particularly as we have seen widespread hunger all over the world following uh, a number of the restrictions that were introduced as part of the COVID responses by various governments from uh, different corners of the world. It is um, quite uh, instructive when we bring together scholars and uh, practitioners and thinkers and actors in civil society to reflect on our contemporary times and also to, to help frame what the different futures might look like. And in today's webinar, we're doing things a little bit differently. We have a two-part um, uh, program today. The first being uh, a launch of um, um, a book Rethinking Social Sciences with Sam Moyo, which is co-edited by Praveen Jha, Paris Yeres, and Walter Chambati. And our esteemed colleagues are going to uh, tell us a little bit more about that book that we'll be launching today. Following the launch of the book, we will listen to our keynote speaker of the day, who is Walter. Um, Give me a second. Walter Chambati, who's going to be speaking to us about revisiting the land agrarian questions in Africa. Um, but first I'm going to hand over to Paris and to Yaris uh, for us to launch the Rethinking Social Sciences with Sam Moyo and have a discussion on what that book entails and most importantly, where those who are interested in the book might be able to get it. Over to you, Pravin. You, you are on, on mute. So do we start with the display of the book or that comes, okay. Yes, please. Right. Show us the book. Yes. <laughs> the mysterious book. <laughs> Thank you. There you have it, colleagues. Beautiful cover with a picture of our friend, yes. Sam Moyer. And as always, we wish he continues to rest in peace. And uh, his legacy lives on in these spaces through friends and networks and also th through taking forward some of his brilliant ideas and, and re-engaging with them. Praveen, over to you. Thank you very much, Masego, and welcome all the colleagues, friends. This is indeed a very special occasion, an occasion when we pay a tribute to Brother Sam, his legacy, a remarkable life. And it is, of course, also a very somber occasion because we continue to struggle with the pain and loss of his untimely departure in a cruel accident in Delhi almost four years ago. How we wish this celebratory occasion would have been pushed long into the future with Sam still around. Alas, that was not to be. Nonetheless, in spirit is with us and let's celebrate that togetherness. A couple of brief remarks before Paris tells you about the book. This book puts together 
a number of uh, contributions which were published in a special issue of the journal that Sam founded. He was the founder editor in chief of the uh, journal called the Gradient South. And uh, soon after his departure, we invited a few colleagues to share their thoughts. So some of those pieces and then a conference that we had done in Delhi where there was a fantastic participation from across the world. Five continents were represented through their eminent scholars. And this book brings together these contributions through the journal and the conference. Let me also share with you that almost everyone who was invited to contribute to the book immediately agreed. Unfortunately, because of certain deadlines relating to publication, etc., we could not include everyone. But this again is almost a global kind of partnership in celebrating Sam. As I said, five continents and uh, uh, on a whole range of areas that uh, Sam uh, worked on. Most of you would know that uh, Sam was indeed a seminal thinker truly an organic intellectual, deeply rooted in a non-Eurocentric perspective, a third worldist in terms of his vision, truly a South-South kind of partnership, which was at his heart in all his work and so on. And not only through his research, but very creative partnerships that he forged he possibly was one of the most unique figures in the world in the last roughly 30 odd years or so in promoting that kind of South-South partnership through very dynamic research collaborations. And as I said, deeply embedded in the epistemic sovereignty of the South. His own research interests spanned a very wide range, as I mentioned, land questions, agrarian questions, national questions, social movements, ecology, sustainability, you know, alternative policy regimes, you name it. Fundamentally, all this tied up in his quest for what we can describe as a political economy vision of progressive transformations rooted in justice and sustainability from the perspective of the South. So that is what really bound his work together, cemented his quest together in different areas and so on. Contributors to this book have in our assessment done justice to Sam in engaging in a very rich and very substantive manner in a dialogue along almost all these research interests and quests that I mentioned in the foregoing. With that, let me pass on the baton to Brother Paris to talk a little more about the book. Paris, the floor is yours. And thank you, Masego. Thank you, Pravin. Thank you. Pa uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for being here with us today. Um, we were we are launching this uh, this wonderful little book that we have uh, a present for Sam, uh, for which I'm sure he's very proud of us to to, to have uh, brought to fruition after uh, several years. Um, Praveen um, has captured uh, very well the essence of this project and Sam's. Uh, Sam's uh, contribution. I will uh, only expand a bit on um, some of the aspects of this book that uh, uh, could be highlighted. First of all, this is, uh, as, as noted, this is a tricontinental initiative. Uh, in fact, it's more than uh, three continents. It's uh, five continents that came on that came on board. Uh, the um, uh, it's been published by Tulika this year, in the beginning of this year. Talika Books in New Delhi, who are with us today here on this uh, conversation. Um, and it is uh, distributed uh, by Columbia University Press 
um, in uh, a good part of the rest of the world, uh, 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 from what I have uh, understood. The, there is a special discount rate for this occasion, which will last for a month, uh, a 20% discount using a code uh, CUP20 uh, when ordering from uh, Columbia University Press. This is for this occasion and also uh, in celebration of Tulika's uh, 25th uh, year uh, anniversary. So the book has three sections. Uh, one is on the epistemic vision and contributions of Sam Moyo. Um, some of his closest colleagues have written for, for this uh, section. Nozikata, who should be joining us soon. William Ma, who I see here, uh, who's already with us. Uh, Gladys Latini from Argentina. Uh, Lino Somme, Ian Schoons. Uh, Ko Jinor from Ghana, Tendai Marisa, uh, some of his closest uh, associates and, and uh, uh, scholars with whom he, he had the close dialogues over time. The second section is on land and agrarian, uh, land agrarian labor questions. And then we have uh, Utsa Patna, Prabhat, Scott, sorry, Prabhat Patnaik, Erdam Banerjee, Arjuna Prasad, who's with us. Uh, Smita uh, Gupta, Sandeep Chatra, who's also with us here, and um, Anna Mitra, Roy Chaudhry. Then we, there's a final section entitled Unfinished Dialogues on uh, uh, Revolution and Liberation, where we have uh, Samir Amin, Isa Shivji, Utsa Patnaik, uh, uh, Professor Sh uh, Chandra Sekar, and Jayati Ghosh, and our, our um, uh, Colleagues in China, Airbus uh, Wang, Wen Tijun, Sitsui, who is with us today, and uh, uh, Lao Kinchi, Dinesh Abro from India, and Yoichi Mine from, from Japan. So it's a really robust uh, lineup for this book. Everyone did their best to put this together. Um, and it is uh, beyond the uh, tribute to so an engagement on. Uh, with the challenges that the social sciences face today. So it's not only a tribute to Sam, but also a real engagement with some of the main issues that the social sciences and, and challenges of the social sciences face today. Uh, <clears throat> we knew, those who worked with Sam closely knew that his contribution, uh, work of art over many years, uh, larger than the sum of his parts. So he worked on various fronts, which, uh, uh, for those who knew him best and clo close, worked with him closest, knew that it formed a larger uh, part of, 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 of a project, which was in essence, the indigenization of the social sciences, consistent with the struggles for national liberation and continental and regional liberation. Uh, this is really the project that Sam represented. Uh, he had many collaborators, over time, um, and this marked his whole life, how to transform the social sciences into uh, an instrument uh, of national uh, liberation. He was heir to the Pan-Africanist tradition. Um, he was a, a, a uh, contributor and, and uh, main participant in the Pan-Africanist tradition of political economy. Yeah. Uh, whose task it was to rethink African and world history on Africa's own terms. So he was heir to that tradition. Mm -hmm. He uh, received his training in the 1970s, his intellectual formation, uh, his intellectual baptism of fire, as we call it, in the 1970s in West Africa, after he had left uh, uh, colonial Zimbabwe, um, where he uh, interacted uh, with luminaries such as uh, Shikata Diop, Samir Amin, and uh, many others who at that time were setting up uh, the Council for the Development of the Social Sciences, Social Science Research in Africa, CODESTRIA, uh, like Abdallah Bujra, later Tandika, Makandawire, uh, Zenta Des, Fe, the whole uh, Mahmoud Mamdani, and, very, and many others. Sam straddled two generations. He was heir to the Pan Africanist tradition. But he also was part of the second generation um, of Pan-Africanist scholars who uh, were committed to training in the continent the subsequent uh, generations that were coming 
and, and growing uh, at the time. He was a, a figure in, uh, between these two generations. Um, this tradition of political economy grew in conflict first with the Eurocentric uh, political economy that was uh, very present to this day, in fact, on the continent. Uh, Marx political economy with a Eurocentric uh, vocation. So the, the Pan African tradition grew, uh, 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 set as its object the overcoming of this uh, 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 of this uh, Eurocentrism. But in the 80s, 90s, then this whole tradition evolved further uh, in conflict with uh, neoliberalism um, and the culturalist turn of the, especially the 90s. So the Pan-Africanist tradition of political economy evolved. Yeah? And Sam was a key player in all of this. Um, he was an institution builder uh, on the continent in Zimbabwe and in the South. So Kodestria was always a source of strength. Um, that's where he, 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 he sought uh, refuge uh, against intellectual isolation. Uh, he became president, vice president and then president of Kodesvia. In the 2000s, uh, uh, he became president. He also uh, it, uh, built institutions or contributed to the building of institutions in Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwe Institute of Development Studies in the 80s, the Zimbabwe uh, uh, Environmental Regional Organization and, uh, in the 90s and, and um, uh, CEREPS, the Southern Africa Research Institute for Policy Studies. And finally, he founded the African Institute for Agrarian Studies in 2002. Um, from then on, he also launched the South-South uh, initiatives. Uh, first, uh, he was a, a very important figure in the South-South uh, collaboration of Codestria and Claxo, uh, together with uh, Gladys Lecini, who contributed to this uh, volume. Uh, he participated in the Third World Forum, the World Forum for Alternatives, and finally he uh, spearheaded the formation of the Agrarian South Network and this and this journal. Uh, just briefly, his his intellectual formation. Uh, he, he had a holistic vision of the social sciences. Uh, this was the heritage of the 1970s in in in, uh, in the Pan African tradition. Uh, at the same, the center of gravity of his concerns were the land and agrarian questions uh, in Africa, yeah, given that the, the large majority of the population uh, was, and the majority continues to be uh, rural based in Africa. His lineage, in, his intellectual lineages, uh, more specifically, uh, as he himself acknowledged, uh, were Mafeje, Archie Mafeje, primarily, as well as Amin, and, and several others. Um, who remained close to him until until his passing, like Isa Shivji uh, and others, uh, Zodin Sikata, um, and, and, and a number of others. The on Zimbabwe, he was uh, devoted to the land question and land reform, which he defended rigorously through hard-nosed uh, research throughout the 2000s. Uh, and in the context of Africa, he took Mafej's and, uh, uh, analysis further to show that, uh, first of all, the difference between settler and non-settler Africa uh, remained important. However, even non-settler Africa was uh, experiencing land alienation uh, and um, land concentration. This was a pioneering, this was an important statement in, in the 2000s, which he made in Condestria and uh, before the land grab literature came on board. So the, uh, on the South front, he built uh, slowly a, a network uh, through the uh, publication of books, which eventually came to be a, a the, the so-called Reclaiming Trilogy. First it was Reclaiming the Land, then Reclaiming the Nation, and then Reclaiming Africa, which was published posthumously. Um, finally, the, the, what emerges from Sam's uh, emerging principles of what we call epistemic sovereignty. Uh, first of all, so for Sam, there was no distinction uh, between an organic local intellectual and a, and a universalist intellectual as has uh, often been presented 
uh, as a as a as a clear as a as a sharp distinction. Sam did not believe in this and did not represent this such a dichotomy. Uh, also, he did not believe that uh, uh, there was a distinction between political economy and analysis of representation or discourse analysis. He was fully capable of uh, unmasking uh, white supremacism, uh, the ideology which sustained an economic uh, system in, in Zimbabwe. Um, he also believed that epistemic sovereignty was much more than academic freedom uh, or, epistemic, or epistemic freedom uh, he focused, uh, he was very concerned about the material conditions of knowledge production. You know? um, he was concerned with the establishment of autonomous and viable scientific infrastructure, uh, publicly and adequately, adequately funded centers of higher learning, uh, and with breaking the monopolies uh, in the publication industry. That was uh, a very important aspect of his thinking about uh, epistemic sovereignty. There was a material context which needed to be uh, overcome. The other aspect was the, the ideological uh, struggle for indigenizing the social sciences. And for this, uh, he, he, he believed that the, there had to be an organic relationship uh, working close to the ground, especially in the rural areas. You know? He was always a critic of urban-based, urban-biased uh, uh, social science. Uh, he believed that social science had to have an, had, had to have an anchor in, material, in, the, in the material realities of the modern world. He believed that uh, it was necessary to recognize collective authorship of the Pan-Africanist tradition against various strategies of appropriation. Uh, he believed that uh, developing ideas uh, was a task that needed to be done collectively via concrete networks such as Codestria and Agrarian South. In an interview he gave uh, in China, also published posthumously, he, he has a statement, he says the network is also the method. Yeah. So these networks for him were, were a way of developing ideas um, and, uh, in a collective fashion. He did not believe in an individual uh, scholarship. Uh, and he also believed that uh, um, particularity and universality could only be attained through collaborative work, uh, through comparative work on a South-South basis, which also was, was the, the basis of, of, of uh, the South-South uh, solidarity, which he spearheaded. Sam's rare feat, finally, was to establish the conditions for a tricolor whose center of gravity also remained in Africa. Uh, today there we can find numerous uh, such it is, um, but his point, but they're not always based, uh, the, the center of gravity is not necessarily Africa, it's actually not so. so Sam was very clear about that. Um, then, we can, to cap it all off, uh, his greater feat even was to pull all this into, put all this into motion without making personal enemies. Sam was loved by everyone all over the world, whatever the, the politics were. Uh, he was uh, uniquely capable of crossing the political divide and making friends everywhere. Um, one might recall, as we mentioned in the book, Engels, Engels' eulogy to Marx at Marx's graveside, where he said, I make bold to say that though he may have had many opponents, he had hardly one personal enemy. And that certainly uh, applies to Brother Sam. Paris. Thank you, thank you so much. And um, you, you, you know, I, I, I didn't think that it was going to be possible for you to actually sum up one, the summary of the book, but also in that uh, context as well, just give testimony to a life of somebody uh, as great as our, you know, colleague, comrade, brother, friend, uh, Professor Sam Moyo. And both you and Pravin have been able to to say so much in the in the twenty in the twenty minutes, I think what really stood out for me, which stands true 
of who and what Sam was is the, the three things that, that you said, you know, the, the kind of um, importance and emphasis that he, 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 he uh, put on ideation and the importance of creating spaces for ideas and for thinking, for, for writing and for political economy analysis to one, come from the continent, but in the same breath, the second thing that you said, building solidarity and networks, um, the South-South networks and networks that even go beyond this dichotomy talk about when we talk about the South-South networks. He also didn't shy away from having a public voice and being very clear with clarity of thought on where he stood on issues based on his own assessments, no matter how politically hot the situation was. And I recall here uh, some of his public utterings on the reform process in Zimbabwe. And I often wonder what he would make of the conversations that we're having at the moment about the, the compensation um, that the government of Zimbabwe has recently signed off for the 4,000 individual white farmers who lost land under the land reform process in, in Zimbabwe. There's just so many questions um, that, that remain. And in this moment, when we are thinking about how to meet the, the, the question of providing food and addressing world hunger in the midst of one of the greatest pandemics to, to face um, humanity. I think Sam would encourage us to go beyond just the current moment to look at a historical analysis and continue those conversations around who owns the means of production. Uh, what is the redistribution agenda? What is it that makes our system so fragile that three months into a lockdown, people may be struggling to feed themselves. Um, he definitely uh, not only shared bright ideas, he did leave a legacy in the form of uh, the institutions that you also spoke about, Codestria, and also the Samoyo Institute of Agrarian Studies that kept going at a time when there were very few places that were insisting on using the political economy as a lens to understanding the agrarian question when it was even considered to be old fashioned. So it is um, not accidental. I, I actually think it is such a great honor that uh, today we have with us um, Walter who will uh, be as a keynote speaker because Walter is a, again, a living legacy of uh, Sam's contribution. Somebody who worked closely under the mentorship of Professor Sam Moyo and continues to hold his own and take us in directions that, that, that encourage us to think about new, both old and new questions around um, agrarian reform in the continent. But before I introduce the next session, I see that Pravin would like to, to, to make a comment briefly. Pravin. Uh, yes, Masego, just a request before Walter starts, let us display the book again for those who joined us late. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't have a book to display, but I will. <laughs> uh, we are sorry that you don't have a copy, but you will get a copy soon. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations to all who were involved um, uh, in publishing that book. And I'm also glad to see that both the authors and the publishers did think about making the book accessible to everyone. So try and get a copy while that discount is still, is still running. At the end of the talk, we will repeat the code so that you, you know what code to, pit, to put in so that you can qualify for the discount. Um, but yes, please um, get yourselves a copy. Uh, I can assure you, you will not be disappointed in just the depth of the issues that are covered and just the relevance of it in, in, to, in today's, um, today's times. So with that, I would like to move on to, to the next session. And as I was saying, um, it is just really befitting that we've got with us Dr. Walter Chambati as the keynote speaker. And the title of his talk today is Revisiting the Land and Agrarian Questions in Africa. Executive Director of the Sam Moyo African Institute for Agrarian Studies based in Harare, Zimbabwe, editor of the uh, uh, 
Agrarian South, um, Journal of Political Economy. He has published extensively on land, labor, and agrarian relations in Zimbabwe and Southern Africa. Walter is also a co-editor, as you heard earlier, of the Rethinking Social Sciences with Sam Moyo, which was published this year. And he's also a co-editor of the forthcoming Labor Questions in the Global South, which is going to be published by Springer. We're also looking forward to that. Prolific um, uh, author, uh, he's uh, also an editor of Farming and Working Under Contract, Peasants, uh, Peasants and Workers in the Global uh, Agricultural Value Chains, to liquor books. And um, with, with Walter, uh, we will also hear from uh, Professor Achana Prasad, uh, who is going to be uh, the discussant. She is from the Center for Informal Sector and Labor Studies. Professor Achard um, works at the Center of uh, Informal and Labor Studies at the uh, Jahawal Neri University in New Delhi. She's the author of Against Ecological Romanticism, Varia Elwin and Making of an Anti-Modern Tribal Identity and the environmentalism and the left, contemporary debates and futures agenda. Uh, she's a scholar activist of note. Uh, I think uh, the profile of her that I read uh, doesn't do much justice to what it is that, that, that she does. Uh, please ladies. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, Thank you, I Madam can hear you. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. It, it, it is befitting that uh, the title of my uh, presentation today is titled Revisiting Linear Agrarian Questions in Africa. It was at the core, at the heart of uh, Professor Sam Moyo's scholarship over a long period of time. May his ideas live long and continue to inspire our struggle our struggles for the emancipation of the working people across, across the South. So I, I've structured my presentation in, in uh, four uh, broad categories. After the introduction, I'll, I'll briefly discuss <clears throat> the differentiated African uh, land questions. Then I'll move on to highlight some of the challenges related to agrarian transformation in the continents. Then thirdly, I'll, I'll look at uh, some of the policy responses that we've seen in response to the crisis, like this new liberal order that we are seeing on the continent and try to respond to some of the challenges that are being faced in the rural area. <clears throat> then lastly, I'll conclude uh, with a call for progressive agrarian reforms, which put the peasantry at the center of the transformation of the countryside in Africa, and also takes into account gender equity and ecological, ecological imperatives for wider sustainability of our countrysides. Yeah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> over the last six or seven decades <clears throat> after the end of colonization, <clears throat> the continent has failed to make the transition from farm, huh, from farm to factory. In fact, the dominant trend which has been witnessed across Many parts of the South is that of deindustrialization, uh, industries uh, closing down, going under. So it is no surprise that uh, access to land remains key for the majority of the continent's populace who still inhabit in the rural areas, whom we may call peasants, farming on uh, small plots of land on customary, tenor, customary, uh, customary lands, primarily using family labor. <clears throat> to work the land to produce food and surplus for sale in the domestic and uh, uh, international markets for the few that are integrated into the various uh, world markets for, 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 for in the agricultural sector. Yeah. So because agriculture has been bedeviled by a multiplex of crises, most of the peasantry uh, today do not survive on agriculture alone, but live 
by combining a whole range of uh, livelihood strategies, which uh, Moyo and Eros have characterized as a, a generalized condition of semi pulterization combining a different uh, range of uh, livelihood activities, farming and other non-farm activities, which sometimes involves straddling across uh, town and country in order to eke out a survival because of the agrarian conditions that are not suitable for them to uh, reproduce themselves and their, and their families. Yeah, so African peasants, as we have heard in the introduction uh, by the chair, are facing a crisis of uh, reproduction. Outside of Asia, Africa is home to the largest population of food insecure, undernourished, malnourished, poverty is largely a rural, huh? largely a rural phenomenon, also gendered with the majority of women being afflicted by poverty across the different regions of, of the subcontinent. Of course, the conditions are differentiated across the different regions, East, Southern and Northern Africa. Uh, the Horn and the Southern parts are mostly affected by these uh, problems of hunger and uh, malnutrition. Yeah. So Africa, if we go back to Mafeje, Africa is still to resolve the basic agrarian question of improving uh, productivity. Productivity remains low across, huh? across many, uh, many parts of, uh, of the regions. Yeah? It, it's unable to, 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 to supply adequate industrial, uh, adequate uh, wage goods and raw materials to feed into the uh, rudimentary industry that exists across huh? most uh, parts of the, of the continent. So the, the, the accumulation, promoting accumulation from below has been a major challenge uh, for, for, for many countries in the region. Yeah. So this transition, this failed agrarian transition is primarily framed as a question of backwardness, a technological backwardness of the peasantry that impedes that transition from a, a more productive, uh, more productive kind of agriculture, uh, land tenure deficiencies, and so forth, and, uh, as well as ecological imperatives. Yeah, but this this kind of framing tends to neglect the effects of land alienation dating back to the colonial era and the inequalities which have evolved over a long period of time uh, on the basis of. Uh, uh, accumulation from above and accumulation from below. I'll, I'll, I'll speak. I'll speak more of that, as well as the, the, the unequal trade relations are, 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 are not uh, spoken about in terms of trying to uh, construct some of the challenges that the the, the the countryside in Africa faces. The unequal trade relations between Africa and the, the imperialist uh, imperialist centers, and also absence of positive huh, interventions into the agrarian sector. The kinds of which we see in the US, in the EU, in the form of uh, subsidies, uh, heavy, uh, huge subsidies. I, I recall Professor Jao talked about the, the subsidies of a dairy cow is much more than the support that human beings in the South uh, receive. So you have that uh, an equal uh, platform in terms of uh, the farming community across the different uh, parts of the South. Yeah. As you are all aware, Africa, the, 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 the land challenges, the, the, the land and agrarian challenges in Africa can be traced to the various uh, uh, modes of colonization which, we've, which, has, which have been uh, articulated by uh, Semai Amin, the varied modes of colonization in the South. It was largely a, a type of settler colonization which dispossessed the peasantry and pushed them onto the margins, as opposed to the peasant economies in the West where exploitation of the indigenes was largely through particip their participation and integration into the, into the markets. And all, then you also have the Africa of the, of the plantations or the enclaves, which were characterized by, by looting and plunder of natural resources. If you look at the, the DRC and other, and other, and other jurisdiction for, 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 for an example. Yeah. So the, the, the food situation in Africa has evolved over the last uh, 30 years. If you look at the 1970s, most of the African countries were net food exporters. But four decades later, because of various policy changes, largely led by structural adjustment, most of the countries now are net uh, 
net food importers, there's, there's high food import dependency amongst many of the African countries. They rely on a, a, importing food to, to, to meet the demands for, for the whole market. So structural adjustment forced on African governments caused a shift from food self-sufficiency to more or less a food security concept where African governments were told to focus on a product that they have a competitive advantage and then keep uh, forex reserves in order to meet, uh, to meet uh, their requirements for food from different uh, uh, parts of the globe. Yeah, so structural adjustment is set back Africa in terms of its capacity to produce adequate food uh, to support uh, its, growing, uh, its growing populace. Since social adjustment, the, the, the policy space for African governments to chart an autonomous development path has been shrinking. Most of our states today uh, take cue from the Britain Woods institutions and bilateral donors from, from the North or, or, the, or, the, or the West, if you like. Yeah. So these challenges of, 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 of food has, have been uh, persisting over the last uh, 20, 20 or so years. And the recent solution that we've seen that has been suggested was that of uh, dispossessing the peasantry of their land to reconstitute large-scale large -scale commercial farms in regions which have historically not uh, experienced settler colonization in order to meet the food deficits that the, that the continent is, 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 currently, is currently facing. So the current reforms basically tend to focus, neglect the, 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 the social reproduction requirements of the, of the peasantry, if you like, but focus on uh, trying to, to, to create, generate these uh, large scale commercial farms ostensibly to, to recover the, the food deficits that, that which intensified from the 2008 and so forth with a variety of actors. I, 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 I'll speak more of that. So if you look at the continent, we have a variety of uh, land questioning, a variety of land questions which I classify into five or so broad. One is, which I've already mentioned, the settler land, uh, settler land expropriation and racial land inequities, which I experienced largely in the South and uh, part of the East in Kenya, uh, in the South of Zimbabwe, South Africa and, uh, and, and Namibia. Then we have inequalities which have been evolving over a long period of time as a result of various processes of accumulation from above and from below. Then you have also ethnic and regional differentiation in, in land control, which can also be traced to the divide and rule tactics. If you look at the, the case of Uganda, where various ethnic groups were privileged to own more land at the expense of other. This situation uh, can, be, can be found in a variety in, in various uh, countries across, uh, across the, the ethnic tensions over control of, of land. Then we also have the, the, the control of uh, land and uh, natural resources by foreigners, the concessioning of land to foreigners. So it's also another, one of the key uh, questions that uh, we face uh, at the current uh, juncture. Then lastly, gender inequalities in, in land access and insecurity. Yeah. So if you look at the settler question in, in, a, in a nutshell, yeah. As I've said, it, it, it entailed the, the, the disposition, the disposition of, of the peasantry from their prime lands and being pushed to the margins. In South Africa, as much as 80% of the land was confiscated from, from the peasantry and converted into freeholds, uh, freehold land for the white settlers, Namibia up to 50%, Zimbabwe up to 45%. So you have that unequal distribution as a result of disposition of, of land which occurred under colonial under colonial conquest. Yeah. Then if, if you look at uh, the inequalities which have been arising as a result of accumulation from above and uh, from below, before I get to that, overly in the continent we're, we're, we're noticing a growing trend of land scarcities. Since the 1950s, there's been a declining per capita farm sizes. Uh, farm sizes have been declining. People are, as a result of population growth, Increasingly, households are getting access to less and less land as the population grows. The demand for, for, for land is also growing in tandem with the population growth. So increasingly, we are, we are, we are noticing a, a scarce growing scarcity of land, although Africa is 
tends to be portrayed as a continent where there's vast and uh, abundant land. But in reality, if you look closely at the, 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 the kind of land that we have on the coast, the bulk of it is of a semi-arid type, not suitable for agriculture and so forth. Yeah, so the, the, the usable land that has been growing scarcely for, 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 for arable uh, land and so forth before you, you even talk about the issue of, of inequities, inequalities in the distribution of, uh, distribution of land. Yeah, so recent studies have also shown the, 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 the intricate yeah, linkage between access to land and poverty. So poverty, which is largely a rural phenomenon in Africa, is also directly linked in a direct relationship between with access with access to land. People households would command uh, less land are also coincide with those households who are also found within the poor stratums of uh, of society. Yeah. So as a result of processes of, of accumulation from below and from above. There's been a, a, a trend of rural differentiation in terms of accumulation, for accumulation of land. These dynamics play out differently across different uh, countries. In some parts, you have traditional leaders who are, who are largely considered to be the custodians of customary land, accumulating uh, amazing uh, land together with their friends and relatives. So there's differentiation in the land sizes that are owned by the different households, there's no homogeneity in terms of the land size that you come across within the countryside. So this process of accumulation from, from below as well as from above, our states, most states from the 1970s have been promoting this phenomenon called middle farm, promoting a, a type of uh, commercial farming, largely benefiting uh, at least some of that land has been uh, taken away from, from the peasantry. If you look at uh, Malawi and Zimbabwe, it also such kind of uh, uh, programs to, to promote middle farms, Zambia and so forth. So there's this tendency of the middle farm, which has been parceling out land to urban, uh, urban elite civil servants. So we are noticing this growing uh, trend of rural differentiation as a result of processes of accumulation from above and uh, from, 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 from below. So a, a process of, the, the, Inequalities have been growing across many countries, Kenya, Malawi, Ivory Coast, Mozambique, Ghana, Nigeria, and Zambia. If, if, if you want to, to, to look, if I give you an example here, in Kenya, 20% of the population now own over 50% of the arable land, while the rest own an average of one acre. Yeah. So landlessness has also been on the rise as a result of a few sections of society accumulating, accumulating land uh, uh, together with the uh, uh, clan based, uh, class based elites, and so forth. Yeah. But then the third dimension, which we could also speak about, relates to the, the issue of foreign, uh, foreign land ownership, parceling of land to foreigners for, for, for mining. This has been a, a major problem across uh, both in the southern part, Western Africa. Uh, yeah. Land has been concessioned mostly. Uh, land belonging to peasants being concessioned as mining, huh? mining concessions, depriving the peasantry of much needed land to, to reproduce themselves in their households. Then the, the, the fourth problem, which we can look at relates to the outward focus of our land use policies and uh, the discriminating, discriminatory land use regulations. Yeah. So alongside structural adjustments, most of our African governments were aged to adopt export-led growth, including in agriculture. So development policies, including macroeconomic incentives, have been focused towards promoting exports, huh? produce for exports, rather than uh, producing uh, adequate food for the, for, for, for the whole market. If I give an example of my own country, Zimbabwe, up to 65% of the credit that comes through uh, the private sector is channeled huh? is channeled towards export crops such as tobacco. So there's this imbalance in terms of prioritization of, 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 of food for the whole market and uh, export. Most of the, the policies are geared towards boosting, hmm? boosting uh, export uh, production uh, to earn foreign currency and so forth. And in the agricultural sector, large farms tend to be considered as critical 
for the development of exports. And small farms tend to be relegated to focus on production for consumption and domestic markets with little support from, from the states. So low productivity characterize uh, uh, crops which are uh, uh, crops and livestock which are produced by the peasantry. So this export focus, uh, export this focus on exports has led has led to this, this commercialization of agriculture has led to increased pressure huh, for land as people as various uh, stratums of society wish to enter the various uh, lucrative uh, export production. Yeah, and informal land markets have been on the rise and women have been under pressure to vulnerable for sale to the emerging huh? capitalist farmers who are willing to, who are wanting to enter these uh, so-called export, huh? export, export, uh, export change, export chains. Yeah. So with increased commodity production and growing individualization and particular application of customer related rules have withered away women's tenure security as people struggle to gain a foothold in this uh, uh, export, uh, so-called export chain. Then the fifth, fifth problem we could look at relates to discriminatory customer tenure systems yeah, in the land markets. As you will recall, most of our governments inherited this dual uh, land tenure systems in which customer tenure was considered as inferior to freehold, uh, freehold title. Most of the customary lands, the, the radical title is held by the states, which has power to uh, confiscate land in the interest of the public. Most of our constitutions across the continent have got this, uh, the state is empowered to, 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 to confiscate land in the interest of the, in the public interest. They say the lawyers will, will, will educate us more on the, yeah. On the, on the issue of uh, public interest. So contrary to indigenous tradition, most of, the Africa, most of Africans living under customary tenure systems have tended to occupy lands by permission of the state, which is the ultimate, uh, ultimate owner or holder of the radical title. So we've witnessed across many parts of the continent how the state has used this power to dispossess and push the peasantry to facilitate the entry of uh, various types of domestic or foreign uh, or foreign capital, forced removals of people are, are, are common across to to institute various types of uh, uh, activities, including mining, uh, large scale agriculture, and so forth. So this insecure form of tenure that many of 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 the peasantry still live right today restricts their secure access to land in order to, to, to reproduce themselves. So in summary, state land expropriation is a major, is a main source of land tenure insecurity in the interest, in, in the public, yeah? in the public, in the public interest, yeah? So what we're calling for is a land tenure security that should guarantee a secure place to live from threat of eviction with access to productive in natural resources. Most of our present of our peasants today lack that kind of uh, uh, provision as a result of the ex that keeps on hanging of them from the state. So the state is a, is a, is a main source uh, of, of threat to the secure access for those holding land in the in, in the customary in the customary in the customary areas. Then sixthly, the issue of gender inequalities in land access and tenure insecurity. Women's access to, to land and control, women's access to and control of land is inadequate and constrained by various customary practices which privilege men as the farmers uh, in the context of the patriarchal social relations which permeates most of our countrysides in the continent. Yeah, so Within the household, women provide labor under severely exploitative relations of production. Clan and family patriarchs control huh, the means of production. Huh? Male, head, male heads are the dominant actors in determining the use of 
land and the rewards that come from the land to the detriment of, of, uh, of women. So the rewards are inequitable across the different members of, of the households within the countryside. Yeah. So the, 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 the COVID-19 pandemic has, has, magnified, huh? has magnified the crisis related to, 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 to the land questions uh, in Africa today. You recall at the beginning, I said most of the, the, the peasantry today are unable to survive on the basis of agriculture alone because of the, the conditions do not support adequate uh, social reproduction for them and, uh, and their families. So the, 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 with, the, with the pandemic coming in to the fore, it has disrupted the various uh, livelihood path, the same plotarian strategies has been severely curtailed as it entails moving from one place to the other to eke out a living. So the lockdowns have curtailed other avenues which contribute huh, to the reproduction of, uh, of, rural, of rural households. Although we know that deindustrialization has been underway for, 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 for some time for the last two, three decades, the pandemic has decimated a sizable number of vulnerable jobs in the informal sector, most of which remain shut as we speak. And some of those jobs are not going to come back that have been shut by the pandemic. Yeah, so what we've seen with the pandemic, we've seen flows of people, as always, when urban livelihoods become constrained, land becomes the full, the, the full back position. So we've seen people returning back to the countryside with implications on the struggles, huh? on the struggles for, uh, for land. Yeah? And women are at risk of being pushed further to the margins. Uh, some of the male counterparts return to, try, return to the countryside to try to eke out, to eke out a, a living. So on top of, of the existing uh, challenges in the land sector that, we, that the continent has been facing, the pandemic has exacerbated the, 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 the demand for land as uh, urban livelihoods have become constituted and restricted as a result of the decimation, the decimation of uh, jobs in the urban, in the urban, in the urban areas as a result of the, the, the various lockdowns implemented by governments across, yeah, across the, the countries. Yeah. So moving on to the next section, try to illustrate to, to, to briefly discuss some of the challenges that relate to the transformation of agrarian challenges of agrarian transformation in the continent. Yeah. So one key issue that I'd want to flag out upfront relates to across many of our countries, the, 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 the development needs of small producers are tend to be held on the back banner. They are not prioritized. Yeah. They are considered as subsistence. So the focus is largely on, uh, on large farms who are considered as the, as the, 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 the suitable, huh? the capable agent to lead uh, transformation in the country, despite their dependency on uh, subsidized imported inputs and export focus, and also the, the ecological damage that this uh, high input industrial agricultural type of farming has been causing, has been causing uh, to the environment. Yeah. So food, as I've said earlier, food import dependency has been on the rise. Most of the countries today depend on uh, food aid. If you look at uh, our, our region, Southern Africa, there's a variation between 50 to 70% of the food needs of most of the countries is imported to, to, to meet the, 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 the requirements of the home market. Yeah. To that, you also add the climate crisis, which has been picking up over the last two decades Again, I'll draw an example from the, from the Southern African region. Since 2012, we've only had only two, uh, two good rainfall seasons. And on top of that, you add the recent disasters which we experienced in 2019 and in 2019, Cyclone Idai and uh, Cyclone, uh, Cyclone Kenneth, we have added to, to, to deflate the, the agrarian uh, conditions. Because of the import dependency, 
Most of our countries are exposed to high global price fluctuations on the international markets, which then affect the ability of different governments, different states to meet different requirements. Yeah. So most of the policy focus, the grand reforms during this period has been focused on enhancing uh, commodity marketing and tenure reforms, some tattling of some sort in Rwanda, Tanzania, yeah, try to, to as a solution to, to, to reverse the underinvestment yeah, in the in the countryside. But this has largely been to facilitate the appropriation of surpluses for large monopolies who, who have cornered the, the market for many of the agricultural products produced on the continent. So there's been a focus of deepening the integration of the peasantry <clears throat> into the world food systems in order to facilitate the appropriation of, 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 of surpluses by uh, large monopolies. So since social adjustment, the neoliberal policies have reinforced the marginalization of small producers. Most of the intervention that we had in the early years of independence was reversed as a result of structural adjustment. And women have been hardest hit. Yeah. The technological deficits, uh, I will not belabor much. The land and labor productivity levels remain, huh? remain very low in addition to the climate uh, crisis that, 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 that I've alluded to, to before, yeah. So given this context of a, of a crisis in the agrarian sector, the policy responses we've seen in the 2000s, the mid 2000s, which picked up after the food price hikes of 2008, has been the disposition of uh, lands belonging to the peasantry to facilitate the creation of uh, large scale commercial farms ostensibly to recover the food, uh, the food deficits. Challenges with uh, ecological damage and uh, exploitative labor relations that are tend to be found in those large commercial farms. If you look at the history, the history of Southern Africa tells us of the exploitation of uh, labor that took place over a period of a century to facilitate accumulation of white settler agriculture. So there's been this major drive to create uh, large scale commercial farms, particularly in, in, in countries which didn't experience, huh? we didn't experience settler colonization uh, before. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I mean, at this point also advertise our book. We, 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 we published the book, uh, Paris mentioned it, Reclaiming Africa, Scambo and Resistance, Scumbo and resisting the 21st century, which documents some of these dynamics around land grabbing across different uh, parts of the continent, different case studies. Yeah. So there's been this drive to dispossess the peasant. The peasant are the key means of production are increasingly being dispossessed from the peasantry to create to create uh, these large scale agricultural farms, which are considered as the panakia to recover food deficits and bolster uh, agricultural exports. So beyond uh, land grabs, one of the persistent strategies during this crisis has been to increase the integration, huh? the integration, integration, incorporation of African peasantries into the world, into the world markets through different, either through contract farming, either through so-called philanthropic activities, such as AGRA, which is closely tied to large monopoly capital through the supply of seeds and so forth. Yeah, so we're witnessing a, the, the deepening integration of the peasantry in unequal and exploitative relations, relationships with uh, large monopolies, which which control the, the bulk of the, the, the bulk of the world, huh? the world market. Yeah. So as a result. The majority of the food systems across the continent are facing severe attack as these programs tend to be focused on a few commodities and erode the diversity of production and with it the nutritional benefits which come with the production of a variety of crops. They tend to focus on one crops and restrict practices which bolster nutrition within households such as mixed cropping and so forth. A recent report on a damning report on agras. Uh, success or lack of it over the last 12 years by a coalition of civil society and academics 
provides a, a damning account of the impact that Agra has had in the various 13 countries that it operates, including it has failed to, to meet with promise of improving productivity, these eroded uh, seeds of vanity uh, of the different small scale producers that they are working with, the diversity of production, and with it, a rise in, in, in malnutrition affected with mono, mono, monocultures that the type of the type of agriculture that they are promoting. So within this kind, within this context of crisis, the responses that we've seen, responses of uh, to radical, radical responses to land alienation, food crisis, and the demise of the peasantry in Africa that are not donor funded are few and far, far between. To date, the activism has generally failed, the activism of various social movements on the continent has failed to reverse land dispossession. Yeah, popular responses, particularly res resistant to inequitable land grabbing, such as land occupations and other forms of struggle to access resources are mostly isolated, but these do hold promise if they gain momentum. Quick examples that come to mind is the, the Zimbabwe land movement, which overturned uh, the, the monopolization of land held by a few white settlers. Then more recently, a success was uh, uh, in, 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 in Mozambique, a variety of peasant movements and uh, civil society coalitions managed to block the progression of the pro-Savannah pro -Savannah group. And Mali is also another good example to look at how movements have uh, impeded the, the integration of the peasantry into the world markets. Farmers movements in Mali have actively campaigned for the recognition of seeds of ended rights that have now been enshrined in the country's laws yeah, to protect most of our countries were witnessing the yeah, erosion of seeds of energy through various treaties and so forth, yeah, so that they don't conflict with the uh, uh, the, the supply of emanating from the large, uh, from the large monopolies. Yeah. So success, there are few and uh, success cases of resistance which go against the type of uh, reforms promoted by the Bretton Woods institutions. Perhaps one could also mention Malawi, although still it remains largely tied to monopoly capital. The 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 the, 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 the wide. The, the widespread uh, input subsidies that they launched over a couple of years, which bolstered production at least, but largely focused on maize, yeah, on maize, uh, on maize uh, production. To conclude, Madam Chair, uh, I would want to call uh, for an agenda for agrarian reform, which puts the peasantry hmm, at the center of the transformation that we should hope for in the countryside. Yeah, it also takes into account issues of uh, gender equity, uh, uh, rethinking the kind of model of industrial agriculture, which damages the ecology and contributes to the climate crisis currently afflicting the continent at, 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 at this current juncture. So the, the, the purpose of, of this reform after Patnaik, Utsa 2018, should be to create conditions for a rise in agricultural productivity such that, raw, such that raw materials and wage goods needs of a growing manufacturing sector can be met while labor is, re is released. Yeah. Yeah. So, how can agriculture contribute to national transformation through diversified industrialization and improved wage employment? Although other sectors such as mining will also be expected to contribute. Yeah. So land reforms should be at the center of these progressive agrarian reforms that I'm calling for. Yeah. Particularly the, the equitable distribution of, of land and secure, secure land, not necessarily as private property, is a precondition for the social reproduction of an actually existing and growing
satisfying uh, the home market, which will facilitate the diverse, economic diversification, which will also feed into an industrial uh, strategy that we can that we can think of. Yeah, the need for gender equity in these agrarian reforms cannot be emphasized. Women need also to be included in the various uh, uh, reforms, bring back the state to rebuild the productive forces of the small producers. Yeah. So the, the idea of cooperatives as Moyo, Jai and Yuris recently reminded us are also key uh, to, to transcend the constraints that the peasantry face in terms of scale and their power in relation to to, to large uh, monopoly monopoly capital, which is cornered the, the world market. Because the pandemic has disrupted the various agri-value systems, agri-value chains and so forth. I think it's an opportunity for us to, to, to rethink, to think of a food sovereignty project in the context of these disruptions as food is unable to move from one place to the other primarily due to the lockdowns. There are, there are various constraints to the supply of different foods for, for countries which are food uh, import uh, dependent. So we need to think of national and regional food, uh, so regional and national and regional food sovereignty to, to, to bolster uh, the, the transformation of the countryside. I'll, 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 I'll stop there, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. You did a, a good job there, really giving us a, a layout of what the contemporary uh, agrarian question is, um, uh, uh, you know, for, for, for today's topic. And I, I really do like that um, you actually started off by giving us a picture of how the um, agrarian transitions have been stalled over the last six decades and the, the factors that were at play and um, looking at uh, different contexts, uh, really sp uh, starting to speak about um, the questions that Africa is yet to resolve. And this is really a question around uh, how to go about improving um, production. The, the, the big question is, it still goes back to how do we improve agricultural production? And I guess for the mere purpose of um, resolving the twin problem of poverty um, and, and hunger. And where you then landed us, again, is a good place that actually gets to show us the tensions that are at play in how people position themselves and institutions are positioning themselves to provide answers that resolve this question. And uh, what you began to talk about AGRA, which is uh, something that has stepped up as Africa's green revolution and an answer to unlocking um, you know, uh, answers to the question of how we overcome poverty and inequality. You also gave some really interesting examples of what alternatives are emerging in the form of uh, agroecology movements that are led by scholars and uh, citizens, activists and NGOs. The No to, Pro uh, no to Provana movement, Pro Savana movement that we see in Mozambique and also what the land network that you spoke about um, in Zimbabwe. So you've been able to, to help us move from the conceptual framing of what the challenges are to understanding how different actors are coming together as groups um, to provide answers to, to these very complex, complex questions. I'm also glad that you also began to speak about the gender dimensions, which is often a forgotten, a forgotten topic and one that is either left to feminists to unpack or those who are looking at the question of gender, but you demonstrated the intersectionality and the nuance in the lens that we must keep in mind um, as we think through the, 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 the agrarian question. I think um, uh, this is uh, then a good point um, at which uh, I should introduce um, our discussant, Professor Achana Prasad from the Center of Informal Sector and labor studies. She's a pioneering sociologist and anthropologist, as I said in my, in my introduction. And um, she uh, works in the areas of um, 
uh, ecology. She also works, uh, looks at questions of identity, tribal identity and modern identity and um, environmentalisms and, and the left um, as indicated by her various um, publications. Um, Professor Achana, uh, over to you. Uh, she is our main discussant this afternoon. Thank you, uh, Masigu, and uh, thank you, Walter, for that uh, very interesting and important intervention that you made in your keynote speech. But uh, before I uh, sort of get on to discussing some of the themes that have come out of your intervention, I'd like to just make two small comments. The first thing that I'd like to say is that today when we study the contemporary agrarian question, we study it in the context of not only the growing concentration of wealth, but also the growing political power and repression that is going on. That is in the context of the rise of fascism within uh, and fascistic forces with, throughout the world, in the North and the South. And you yourself in Zimbabwe are experiencing the way in which dissent is being repressed. We have seen in the case of, for example, the famous cases of Hope the targeting of Beatrice, all those issues. So I'd uh, first like to start with expressing my solidarity with the struggles that uh, people in Africa are uh, undergoing and also the struggles, uh, the tricontinental struggles in the South, where we are increasingly uh, getting organized for our democratic rights, but we are also increasingly facing challenges where um, uh, peasants, workers, urban poor, and other kinds of classes and uh, uh, minorities, all kinds of people are facing uh, really great repression because of the, uh, uh, the terms within capitalism, not only materially, but also politically and socially, the counter revolutions that are taking place, the entire setback to uh, the women's, the democratic women's movements that are taking place, by rise of conservatism, the, uh, the sort of uh, overplaying of cultural identities that is taking place, not to basically make uh, societies more egalitarian, but to make them more competitive through the intervention of capital itself. So uh, I would like to distinguish between the resistance that is taking place in uh, uh, democratic resistance that is taking place and all kinds of other tendencies that are being unleashed through the intervention of capital and capitalists in almost all spheres of life, the deepening penetration. And I'd like to place the gradient question within that context for uh, 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 within that context. Having said that, I'd like to first uh, sort of uh, make a few remarks about the overall framework and the questions that Walter posed. The main question that he started with is why the transition has not taken place. I would like to pose a counter question to that, that in a world, and he also actually gave the answer to it in the same manner. So I'm not really arguing with uh, Walter. I'm only taking off from the understanding of our understanding in the Agrarian South Network and really taking off from the work of Sam and uh, other sort of very, very, I would not say organic, but grounded intellectuals who practice the praxis, which is the, uh, the dialectical relationship between theory and practice, which uh, I think Sam was really a model 
off. So uh, 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 my counter question to that would be, oh, should we expect the transition to take place in a world which is basically ridden with uneven development? It's not only that the society is ridden with uneven development, but the world per se is ridden with uneven development. And even if you have some form of peripheral capitalisms coming up, the concentration and the accumulation remains very much focused on the powers of the North. Yeah, so having uh, said that, I'd then like to tie it up with, uh, uh, with the distinction that actually Walter made between accumulation from below and accumulation from above. I was wondering whether this distinction is basically just a heuristic or a theoretical distinction, which uh, uh, mm, which sort of uh, mm, uh, which uh, sort of I mean these are not independent processes as you yourself indicated these are not independent processes I mean the allies that capital makes the way in which it adapts not only to uh, uh, local uh, uh, communitarian and class structures and local patriarchies, but the way it molds these local patriarchies and race equations and even deepens the local inequities is something that I'd really like to uh, 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 ask Walter to focus a little bit more about because that will then get us onto a much more uh, interesting understanding of the interface between the changing forms of patriarchy, the changing articulations of uh, race, uh, race uh, relations, and the overall relationship with the way in which classes are formed and differentiation takes place within this larger project of uneven development. So uh, 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 if you look at it, I mean, uh, some of these questions are actually quite common for, uh, for the South as a whole. They are not questions that may be specific to Zimbabwe or specific uh, to some areas of Africa, though their articulation, their regional articulations may be different because their local settings, their local regimes, power equations, and production systems are different uh, from each other. Uh, uh, they are different from each other. So when we talk about the contemporary, and uh, you see, while I'm speaking about this, I was having a look, once again, having a look at the book that we made uh, for Sam, which Walter, uh, Praveen, and Paris edited. And you see some of these questions are quite pregnant in that book. Because if you look at Sam's own work, and I've uh, recently been reading his early work also, the questions of ecology, and uh, uh, you know, equity in all its societal and economic forms is very, very, I mean, these are the challenges, the theoretical challenges that actually Sam uh, throws to us also, that how do we carry this forward? And what are the ways of looking at the challenges uh, that take place and therefore, uh, you know, uh, I'd like, uh, uh, I mean, if there's a chance for a response, I'd like Walter to actually expand on the way in which capitalism uh, uh, penetrates into the local society and what kind of articulations or disarticulations uh, take place. I've read some of Walter's work on land reforms and some of that is quite, in fact, interesting and 
it would be nice if it would come uh, to the fore. Uh, another point that I'd really like to raise is that, and I know that Walter is quite familiar with uh, at this point also, and uh, people have been writing about it also, even in the reclaiming volume and, and in the rethinking volume, both the volumes, that uh, theme was very sort of uh, prevalent is the question of the financialization of agriculture itself. And I think there were some of the most interesting work which Walter and Sam did together uh, in Zimbabwe actually shows you how the contract and the finance actually brings up a new stage of capitalism within agriculture itself. So uh, 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 that is something that I wanted to bring up, which was implied in actually Walter's, uh, um, uh, Walter's presentation, but uh, which I don't think he had the time to really fully talk about because that is the form that is hitting us now. It's hitting us now that in the tribal area in which I work, a company does not need to own the land anymore, but it can control the land. The fact that it cannot does not own the land and can control the land. Now, that itself has uh, 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 an implication for the gender division of labor. It itself has an implication for the, uh, the ethnic uh, concentrations and divisions that are taking place within land relations itself. So uh, this is something that I'd like uh, uh, also uh, some more insight from Africa. I mean, one could talk a little more about India, but uh, you know, that would uh, really just throw the discussion uh, off and there's not that much time also. So uh, that is uh, another issue that I would like to uh, raise right now. The uh, third thing is about social reproduction. I think that we really, in the context of what I've said, I think that we really need to reconceptualize or widen the scope of what we know as social reproduction. Because social reproduction is not only a material process, according to me, it's also an ideological process. And that ideological process is not merely in terms of stereotype roles, but the way in which community institutions and families get embedded in new relations of capital and labor. And the kind of norms and the morality that they, uh, uh, that they sort of, uh, what should I say, uh, uh, the norms and the morality that they follow or transform or even reinforce in order to support uh, what uh, Walter in fact called the uh, uh, accumulation from below. But I, I would say that the, in order to support the different nodes of accumulation, in the larger accumulation process. Yeah. So if uh, if we look at uh, social reproduction in that way, then I think that uh, the agrarian question uh, with respect to social reproduction is not only focused on land. It's true, land is really very important because of the different forms of semi proletarianization that are taking place that we very well know from uh, the work of the scholars associated with the Agrarian South Network and the way in which they have intervened in the contemporary agrarian debates. But uh, I think that that issue needs to be pushed by us a little bit more. Because if we push it a little bit more, then that means that we are also breaking new ground in the way in which we look at the agrarian question itself. Then we don't look at the gender question as a separate question. We don't look at the race question as a separate question. We look at it as one question 
were different power uh, dynamics are at play and those different power dynamics lead to uh, influence the process of class formation and the changes in the social structure uh, itself. So uh, that's the other issue I want to raise. The uh, perhaps, uh, how much time do I have? Maybe two minutes, five minutes? Two minutes, okay. Two more minutes. Two more minutes. So uh, maybe I'll just telegraphically pose pose a couple of other questions that arise out of uh, the trilogy and out, out of uh, also the rethinking volume, but maybe something that our network also needs to work uh, on in a more focused uh, manner. The one is, which actually Paris uh, uh, did quite well, Paris and Sam did quite well in the trilogy is also, the question of if the reality, the social reality is to be conceptualized in terms of some of the questions that I have raised, it will, first of all, it will uh, sort of um, raise a couple of issues about what kind of resistance we want. If such fundamental changes are taking place, then what is the resistance? And actually I agree with the fact that defense of land is actually a key point of resistance, but the alliance between the peasant and the worker is something, and the worker in all its segments, women workers, tribal workers, black peasants, indigenous uh, workers, the workers, it's all in segments. That means that our resistance will have to resolve the contradictions within the working classes itself. Mm -hmm. That means that our resistance and our resistance strategy will have to uh, resolve the contradictions between the working classes itself, within the working classes itself, in order to forge a solid unity against this fascistic agrarian, uh, fascistic capitalism that is now basically directly through its corporations, raising the uh, uh, raising the bar of accumulation to even air, for example, in the climate crisis, as uh, Walter had mentioned. So these are some of the issues that I wanted to raise. And uh, uh, I think I'll just stop there. Thank you very much for this. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Prasad. I, I, I was really struggling to, to step in and stop you because you were so engaging in um, the questions that you are raising in response to the, to the talk that, um, that uh, uh, Walter just, just gave. And uh, precisely where you ended around um, uh, looking at the social reality and the kinds of questions that we, want, we may want to grapple with um, conceptually and uh, also the site of resistance that we may want to, to be engaging with. And you've left us with two points around um, engaging on defense of land as an important site that we mustn't look, lose sight of in the struggles uh, for agrarian reform, but also what you said about the alliance between the peasants and the workers and uh, what raises in terms of uh, the contradictions and the competition, contradiction alliances that we may find within the working class itself. I think these are pertinent questions for um, uh, agrarian reform. I would uh, throw in there that we also have to think about the, the type of um, uh, production 
that 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 we want to see within the agrarian question what i was saying earlier about the tension in ideological directions of re resolving the twin problem of poverty and hunger and this contested contestation between the green revolution and uh, what we're seeing emerge as um, agroecology or food sovereignty and responses and systems that are driven by the farmers, by the farmers themselves. How, where, and how do we position them in this debate? And uh, you also said something that is quite important: that the gender aspects should not be seen separate from questions of agrarian reform within 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 our, our context. They are an integral part of how we resolve both historical questions and we begin to reshape and think um, the, the future. There's a number of questions in the, on, the, on the chat function um, that are coming up, but before I, I introduce those, um, those questions that, that have come up is um, we have here uh, one more speaker that I've been asked um, to, to introduce and um, this is, um, uh, I just want to make sure that I, I get the, 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 the name right. But this is Professor Sitsu, uh, who uh, has been asked to, to jump in on the panel and provide a response as well to both issues that you've raised and um, that uh, Dr. Chambati has raised. Uh, Professor Sitsu is, uh, Associate Professor at the Institute of Rural Construction of China, Southwest University and founder of the Global University for Sustainability. Um, Prof Sitsu, I will give you an opportunity to speak, but I'm also going to ask you to be brief. I'm not, if you could please just not take more than five minutes so that I can open up and give an opportunity to other panelists to make their inputs and ask questions. Uh, Prof Sitsu. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Walter. Presentation and I have questions. Um, uh, in terms of pan African uh, movement, how do you uh, upon the way to the end of the movement? Uh, any uh, um, example of cooperation between the African countries? Because uh, in, for example, in uh, Latin America, uh, in Venezuela, uh, when uh, the uh, Chavez has um, uh, took power, he had also tried to uh, develop some uh, cooperative cooperative uh, project with uh, Cuba. So he um, exchanged the uh, oil for the uh, medical service from Cuba. So I wonder if any uh, some kinds of uh, cooperation between the African countries, particularly in during food project or extreme work. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, the network was a bit, uh, wasn't very good, so I might have missed parts of your question, and I'm going to ask that you type it into the chat um, so that our panelists are able to, to, respond, to respond to it. And uh, meanwhile, uh, before I go back to, to the panelists, I just want to read uh, some of the, the questions that have been and comments that, that have come through, come through here. Um, the one is a question and a comment from Joshua Nyoni. And he says, given the need to respond beyond the agrarian systems challenges in Africa, mostly neoliberal programs, what intellectual and practical capacity can we lend to foresight capacity for innovation and knowledge as we move to the future of agri-food systems? So what intellectual and practical capacity can we lend to the foresight thinking? What are those issues that we have to take into account as, as, as we, we, we move forward? Um, the other question that has come up, uh, or is it a co uh, comment, is from Nancy Kachingwe, and she says, thank you so much, Walter, for your excellent and comprehensive keynote. I'd like to suggest that within the agrarian reform, we move beyond the language of including women, since women or women's labor are already indispensable to the food systems. 
And I think this is quite aligns with uh, what Prof. Passad was saying as well. Inclusion suggests that women are outside the food systems and when in fact the question is the terms of that inclusion, i.e. through capturing women's unpaid labor, uh, unpaid labor, frequently through violent means. Accumulation can't happen without women or households unpaid reproductive labor to secure household well-being. Perhaps we should stop saying inclusion when we really mean exploitation. And that's a that's a, and and she goes on and then says in other words, uh, what needs to be included is the exploitation of women's unpaid labor as part of the system of patriarchal and capitalist accumulation. I'm going to pause here and uh, let the panelists respond to some of the comments, insights, uh, and questions that that came through, and then I will go to the next round, the next round of of questions. Walter, would you like to, to go yes. first and then, yeah, and then Professor Prasad. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. There's a whole range of uh, canvas of uh, comments and questions raised, raised by Achada. <clears throat> I would uh, hesitate to engage with them, all of them at this particular juncture. I'll, I'll pick on some of the issues that she raised and uh, uh, respond to some of the, the questions that she, she raised. But I'll start with Nancy. If, 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 if you notice, I use the term gender equity, which presupposes that women are already part of the system. But we are, what we are wanting to advance is the issue of gender equity in the labor process, in the sharing of uh, rewards that uh, arise from small scale production. So then an inclusion as if they are outside. We, 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 we recognize, I recognize the, the, the <coughs> The, the importance of women both as producers and also as uh, unpaid labor in the domestic sphere to support the whole system huh, of small scale agriculture. So gender equity is, is, is the key terminology that I, I use. It already assumes women are part and parcel of the system, but under an equal terms with, with men in the control of resources, in the sharing of uh, the resources that, uh, Image from their engagement in both agriculture and non-agricultural non -agricultural sectors. Yeah. I, I, I got a glimpse of uh, the question from uh, Professor Sid Sui uh, because of the two challenges. Pan, -Africa, Pan African uh, cooperation of the type that we, 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 we witness in uh, Latin America of Cuba, I think those are few and, and far, far between on the on the continent, we don't have such type of cooperation that I can think of at this particular juncture. But if you look at the example of trade, most of the trade that African countries have is with the outside world rather than intra, huh? intra African trade. There's been a, a concerted effort to try to, to, to build huh? regional, uh, regional trade and so forth. But most of the trade at this particular juncture is with the outside world, South Africa is the, the, the conduit or the penetration of uh, goods coming from outside to penetrate to the north. Yeah. Then the other issue I would uh, I would address uh, the third question I would address at this uh, moment leads to the financial financialization of agriculture. The different ways in which capital is penetrating the countryside. Yeah. That there are variety. That there are variety of of ways. Uh, which I didn't get uh, a chance to speak to, to, to speak about because of the limited time. One, of course, relates to, to the issue of uh, land grabs through dispossession of land, but also another phenomenon which has been gaining ground over the last 20 or so years relates to the issue of contract, uh, contract farming, monopoly, large monopolies uh, promoting uh, contract farming of different uh, types of uh, products, but largely focused on exports, export crops, such as uh, tobacco and so forth. Few uh, food crops are integrated within the, the contract farming uh, or value chains. So what we've seen from our research with regards to, to, to contract farming uh, relates to the unequal, huh? the unequal power relations. China correctly mentions that although they don't directly control the means of the production, 
but they've taken over the labor process of how the product is, is produced, more or less increasingly, uh, the peasants are losing sovereignty and autonomy over how they practice uh, practice uh, you know, small scale agriculture with the, there's so much monitoring and control and so forth, all these integrities to, to, to focus production on the crop that is being funded by the different um, monopoly companies. So that in a sense has, has affected the general relations in, in, in a sense that uh, there's much more pressure uh, for for women uh, for women to 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 to, to work to meet uh, to meet the demands uh, of the different uh, kind of, uh, of of contract farming. But the, and the risk or the risk is more or less the risk of failure of production is more or less borne by these peasants themselves. And one of the key things we, which we, we we notice with regards to contract farming is it, it is reinforcing the the the, 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 the differentiation the inequalities within the countryside because of the, 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 the type of en enrollment programs that these programs entail, mostly targets uh, small scale farmers, mostly what you could consider as rich, rich, uh, rich peasants who already have some form of equipment and so forth, uh, background of resources. So it's reinforcing the differentiation that we see in the countryside as it targets. And women are falling far much uh, further back because they don't have these types of resources to qualify to 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 enroll so that they come with a lot of all things insurance companies contract farming also a conduit for insurance companies to penetrate the countryside and extract uh, surpluses was when farmers enroll enroll on such type of programs they are forced to sometimes to take up insurance for crop failure and so forth so contract farming comes up along with a whole range of other uh, facilitates the penetration of other different types of capital beyond just agrarian capital to include insurance, uh, banking, and so forth. I mean, I, I'll stop there at this uh, point, Madam Chair. I think our time is running out fast. Yes, it is. <laughs> I'm looking at my clock, and we we don't have uh, uh, much time left, and the, the the debate is only just getting getting heated up. I'm just going to read um, uh, a few more questions, not the comments, just the questions, so that in your responses as we're wrapping up, you can you can think about how to 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 respond to that. Um, one of the questions um, uh, comes from. Uh, it, it says here, how do we enter or create markets to agroecology in Africa? And uh, it gives examples that in, in Brazil, there is family farming like MST and a lot of traditional communities. Um, and they look to uh, agroecology as, uh, agro as a way forward. So in the context of our continent, how do we enter and create markets for agroecology in, in Africa. And then the, the, the next question is, how can we solve the problem of ecological and die of agricultural production? And what solutions are available for ethnic groups over control of land? I guess this is where ethnic groups don't have access to land. What is the solution around that? Um, We've already read Nancy's question. The last question uh, from Sudeep says that, um, um, okay, I'll read the, all of this. Thanks to all the presenters for your thought provoking ideas. Uh, hearing Professor Chambati, uh, it seems to me that contemporary land and agrarian questions in Africa are similar to those of Nepal, but solving it from above as a policy question can it be solved through the programs such as land bank policy? The so-called parliamentary left government of Nepal who is shy to utter land program in such a COVID circumstances where land and agriculture has become so important. So do we resolve the um, agrarian question from above and does this mean um, uh, a focus in policies uh, such as the land bank, land bank policy? Is, is the question. And uh, not all questions necessarily should be answered by Walter. Uh, we can also um, open, open up 
um, uh, for uh, our main discussants to chip in as well. Walter, would you like to go first? Yeah, I thought well, you were going to give the platform to Achana. Okay. <laughs> I think she's 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 on mute. I was hoping she would she would jump in. Okay, no, 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 no thank you, thank you, ma'am, Madam Chair. Yeah. So the, the, the issue around um, marginalization of ethnic groups in land access, I guess the, 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 the obvious solution is we need land redistribution to accommodate various marginalized groups to also be part and parcel of a, an equitable and equitable the distribution of uh, secure uh, secure land for them to uh, reproduce themselves uh, uh, and their families. I don't see any other way beyond redistributing from the haves to the have nots to accommodate other 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 rural groups which are marginalized uh, uh, in uh, owning and controlling land. Then with regards to uh, how to resolve that, whether from above or from below. I think the, 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 the forces from below have to put pressure, huh? forces from below movements. Huh? The examples I've gave will put uh, pressure to bear on the state to introduce reforms. Because most of our states are in alliance with uh, agrarian capital. If left to them, transformation is, is going to be very slow and uh, it's going to be a long road for transformation to, to come. So I, I think the, the critical component that needs to play a major role uh, in driving transformation forward are forces from below. If you look at the successful cases of, of, of Mali that have been talking, which have put pressure even to inculcate uh, issues of food sovereignty into the national constitution. I think forces from below movements and different actors are, are, are key in that particular respect. Then agroecology markets, these are slowly evolving in, uh, in Africa, but there's differentiation to the extent at which these have advanced across the different regions. More advanced in, in, in West Africa and much slower uh, disparate groups here and there trying to promote the, 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 the shift from high input agriculture to towards uh, agroecology. So these are slowly evolving, but uh, not as much as would uh, uh, hope for in order to, to, to reverse the ecological damage that has been caused by high input and large scale agriculture. Sorry, I was talking with uh, uh, Michael Mute. Professor Prasad, could I ask you to, to also chip in and, and take some of the, the questions? See, I couldn't hear properly because I went offline in the middle. Hmm. So, uh, so uh, I think you just carry on. I will chip in later. Okay, no, no problem. Um, so uh, Sue had been, um, promoted to a panelist. I wonder if she uh, might have some comments or responses that she wants to throw in just based on uh, some of the questions that, that were shared by, by colleagues. And in the meantime, Professor Prasad, just go through um, questions that are on the, on the chat. Sitsu, would you like to, to come in? Or we can move on to the last round of questions. Um, yes, uh, actually, I uh, also have uh, one, one question about the uh, financialization. Yeah, because uh, when we remember the, uh, the last uh, financial crisis, it happened in 2008. And then at that time, many hot money uh, uh, went into the uh, food market. So uh, it's caused the, the uh, food crisis. So um, I, I wonder whether this um, uh, will have uh, the second second rate of the uh, fin grand final final financialization and so in that uh, in that sense so uh, how the uh, African uh, countries uh, to um, resist this kind of 
financialization. For example, if uh, you have this kind of uh, food production, even you uh, purchase it or uh, you uh, exchange uh, within each other, and then uh, you don't use um, the uh, US dollar or uh, Euro. So um, because uh, nowadays we have uh, this debate uh, within China and about talk to discuss about the uh, um, de-dollarization. That means how can we avoid to use the um, US dollar? But in Africa, maybe you have to use the uh, Euro. So um, I, I wonder if you have this, um, uh, um, I mean, projects or debate or discussion about uh, uh, de-financialization uh, or de-dollarization, de-euroization, and then use your own um, uh, currency to uh, deal with the food um, purchase uh, uh, within uh, African countries. How to pursue this kind of social uh, cooperation in terms of using your um, currency and also to be involved in food production. Yeah, this is my uh, second question. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you for that question. And the one last question that I'd like um, the panelists to also respond to is a question that is on the, on the, on the chat there. And the question is uh, directed to Walter, how to understand land and labor processes in terms of ethnic groups in Southern African countries. And can you give some idea about the land classification in ownership and operational by ethnic groups in rural, in rural areas. And then the last question is how can save the small and poor peasants in dry farming areas from fluctuations of markets? How do we uh, uh, protect peasant farmers, particularly in dry areas uh, from the impacts of uh, market fluctuations? Uh, uh, pra uh, Prasad, should, shall we start with you? And then we have the last word from, from Walter and I yeah, can wrap up. Sure. Uh, so I'll only make uh, two comments. Uh, uh, one question about uh, 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 agroecology. Uh, I feel that agroecological agro system can be uh, an alternative, but I think the jury is still out in on what institutional form it will take. Because if agroecology increases the burden of the workers, then how do we redistribute that burden? I think the redistribution is not only of land or resources, but the redistribution also has, has to be of the care work, the unpaid work, and all the things that go along with that in agrarian systems, including mm -hmm. in, uh, in natural resource use systems. So uh, uh, this is an issue I would like to flag, and I would like to submit that the only way of achieving that uh, uh, equity is to st have a step towards the socialization of care work and social reproduction itself. Mm -hmm. What you right now have is a privatization of social reproduction mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. taking place. Mm -hmm. Private mm -hmm. land holdings, private this, private that, and, and mm -hmm. everybody fends for themselves. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. meeting one's needs also has to be a collective process. And therefore, I would like to visualize the a sustainable socially egalitarian system as one where the redistribution of resources, access, assets, means of production goes along with the redistribution of the burden, of, mm. burden also. Uh, so I think actually I've made both my points uh, in this remark. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you uh, uh, for that, Prasad. Uh, Walter, your, your last words well thank you thank you chair uh, I, I, i'll try to address the, the, the question related to uh, any discourse around de-dollarization in africa i, I think at, at this stage on the continent we have not yet got to that particular stage of discussing 
issues related to how to regain our autonomy in terms of the currency of, uh, of transactions and, and so forth. Largely because most of our trade at this moment is largely with the external world, yeah? Uh, food, most of the food is coming from outside Africa. There's much, there's much less intra-African trade, but also because of the, 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 the poor infrastructure of mo movement of goods from point A to point B across the country. If, if, if you look at our example here in Southern Africa, when, 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 when we are faced with a calamity, it's much cheaper to, to, to move grain from, 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 from Argentina than to move, say, from East or Central Africa because of the of 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 of, uh, of the poor infrastructure and the cost which imposes high costs on the movement of on the movement of of uh, goods and services across across the country i think we, we have to rebuild our, our capacities to satisfy at least the whole market before we start discussing then we can move on to discussing how to enhance the kind of butter kind of trade eh? solidarity across at the moment, we are still deficient, even in uh, in fulfilling our demands for the whole market. So that's a major priority at this current juncture to rebuild capacities of the peasantry to satisfy uh, demand for the whole market, grain and, and other key commodities that we need uh, for the survival of the many people mm -hmm. in the countryside. Mm -hmm. I'll stop there, my dear. <laughs> thank you, thank thank you, Walter, and and thank you, uh, Professor uh, Prasad, as well. Uh, you both gave us some real um, food for thought and uh, we couldn't have exhausted the such a complex topic that we also feel passionate about but it's also a necessity just looking at where we are um, at, at the moment. I, I like that you it, at the beginning and, and the reason for having this series and today's topic uh, was just really to unpack the issues because again we go back to the extent to which COVID-19, the pandemic has just magnified um, and protracted the agrarian crisis. It, it actually re reminded us that with all the reforms that we have seen in the last uh, couple of decades, we haven't really gotten to the crux of addressing the drivers um, of uh, insecurity, food insecurity, the drivers of hunger and the drivers of poverty, particularly in our, in our rural areas. And in your talk, Walter, you also um, took us through a journey through which we see the entrenchment and the penetration of foreign capital into, into rural areas. And you make an important point about the extent to which this is state-sponsored. State-sponsored in how we're seeing foreign di uh, direct investment, um, being courted within the agricultural space. But you also began to give us examples of what was happening in Zimbabwe around contract farming and uh, reminding us not to lose sight that this is not just about how capital makes inroads into the rural areas, but with contract farming comes many other things. We get to see um, uh, um, you know, crop insurance, we're seeing uh, the indebted, you know, uh, small uh, scale farmers being largely indebted, but we're also seeing uh, farmers lose their freedoms and rights around um, seeds and inputs, because with contract farming also comes a particular kind of seed that comes into, into that space. You reminded us that what, what, the, the drive that we're seeing towards that penetration of capital is not necessarily for meeting our needs in terms of uh, food security, but it's to, uh, you know, to provide the supply for commodities that are needed in the international, in the international space. Um, the, the moment that we're seeing now, you both spoke about the re peasantization but even within that, we have to ask, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, Joshua asked a very pertinent question of what do we need to think about when we then begin to think about how to build the capacity of the peasant farmer to, to one, feed themselves, but also to respond to the very powerful forces that are at play in changing the, both the political, social, um, the political and the social landscape in our rural areas. Lots of questions on the gender dimension, and I'm glad that those questions come up 
because uh, the next uh, uh, seminar, the next topic in our seminar series is just going to be focused on that. It's going to be on COVID and gender perspectives, which will be led by our sister, Professor Georgi Tsikata, who is the director of the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana on the, 7th, uh, on the 9th of September. We'll get to dig a little bit deeper on the gender uh, dimensions that we started and, and the gender relations and, and gender dimensions that we started to, to, unpack, to unpack today. And uh, before I go on to, to thank the organizers and name them, I just wanted to remind you again that the book which was launched at the beginning of uh, our discussion, Rethinking Social Sciences with Professor Sam Moyo is available and uh, people can purchase it from, um, it's distributed by the Columbia University Press. And should you wish to purchase an, a copy online, you, you will be able to get a discount, a 20% discount if you type in um, uh, CUP20. And, and, and uh, th that makes that copy uh, affordable, considering it's also priced in US dollars. So that 20% discount goes a long way in us making sure that more people have got um, copies um, of the, uh, uh, you know, have got access and they're able to afford the copies. I would like to thank the supporting partners at the beginning, I mentioned the, the core partners, behind the seminar series, but they don't, they're not working alone. They are supported by the Center for Informal Sector and Labor Studies at JNU in India, the Institute of Agrarian Studies at the University of Ghana, Global University for Sustainability, Hong Kong, China, and the Postgraduate Program in World Political Economy and Educational Technologies and Languages Unit at the Federal University of ABC in Brazil. And um, to thank uh, uh, people who've been working behind the scenes to make this uh, series and today's discussion a success, I'd like to thank Joseph uh, Matai, I hope I pronounced that right, Freedom Mazui, uh, Nabajit Malaka, Isha Chaudhuri, Rajiv Grover, Lalit Dabral, Priyanka, and Susan, as well as Julio. Thank you colleagues for doing such a great job behind the scenes and making it possible for us to have um, this dialogue on this uh, important topic of um, agrarian reform in, in Africa. And thank you, uh, Walter, our uh, keynote speaker and to all the panelists for a great job today. See you in September. Thank you.